Chapter 20, Joseph in Egypt. This chapter is based on Genesis 39 to 41. Meanwhile, Joseph with his captors was on the way to Egypt. As the caravan journeyed southward toward the borders of Canaan, the boy could discern in the distance the hills among which lay his father's tents. Bitterly he wept at the thought of that loving father in his loneliness and affliction. Again the scene at Dothan came up before him. He saw his angry brothers and felt their fierce glances bent upon him. The stinging, insulting words that had met his agonized entreaties were ringing in his ears. With a trembling heart he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation! from the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. But in the providence of God, even this experience was to be a blessing to him. He had learned in a few hours that which years might not otherwise have taught him. His father, strong and tender as his love had been, had done him wrong by his partiality and indulgence. This unwise preference had angered his brothers and provoked them to the cruel deed that had separated him from his home. Its effects were manifest also in his own character. Faults had been encouraged that were now to be corrected. He was becoming self-sufficient and exacting. Accustomed to the tenderness of his father's care, he felt that he was unprepared to cope with the difficulties before him in the bitter, uncared-for life of a stranger and a slave. Then his thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood he had been taught to love and fear him. Often in his father's tent he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home an exile, and a fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promises to Jacob, and how they had been fulfilled, how, in the hour of need, the angels of God had come to instruct, comfort, and protect him, and he had learned of the love of God in providing for men a Redeemer. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him, Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. He then and there gave himself fully to the Lord, and he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. His soul thrilled with a high resolve to prove himself true to God, under all circumstances to act as became a subject of the King of Heaven. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart. He would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. One day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petty child to a man, thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. Arriving in Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, captain of the king's guard, in whose service he remained for ten years. He was here exposed to temptations of no ordinary character. He was in the midst of idolatry. The worship of false gods was surrounded by all the pomp of royalty, supported by the wealth and culture of the most highly civilized nation then in existence. Yet Joseph preserved his simplicity and his fidelity to God. The sights and sounds of vice were all about him, but he was as one who saw and heard not. His thoughts were not permitted to linger upon forbidden subjects. The desire to gain the favor of the Egyptians could not cause him to conceal his principles. Had he attempted to do this, he would have been overcome by temptation. But he was not ashamed of the religion of his fathers, and he made no effort to hide the fact that he was a worshiper of Jehovah. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. 
and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Potiphar's confidence in Joseph increased daily, and he finally promoted him to be his steward, with full control over all his possessions. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. The marked prosperity which attended everything placed under Joseph's care was not the result of a direct miracle, but his industry, care, and energy were crowned with the divine blessing. Joseph attributed his success to the favor of God, and even his idolatrous master accepted this as the secret of his unparalleled prosperity. Without steadfast, well-directed effort, however, success could never have been attained. God was glorified by the faithfulness of his servant. It was his purpose that in purity and uprightness the believer in God should appear in marked contrast to the worshippers of idols, that thus the light of heavenly grace might shine forth amid the darkness of heathenism. Joseph's gentleness and fidelity won the heart of the chief captain, who came to regard him as a son rather than a slave. The youth was brought in contact with men of rank and learning, and he acquired a knowledge of sciences, of languages, and of affairs, an education needful to the future prime minister of Egypt. But Joseph's faith and integrity were to be tested by fiery trials. His master's wife endeavored to entice the young man to transgress the law of God. Heretofore he had remained untainted by the corruption teeming in that heathen land. But this temptation, so sudden, so strong, so seductive, how should it be met? Joseph knew well what would be the consequence of resistance. On the one hand were concealment, favor, and rewards. On the other, disgrace, imprisonment, perhaps death. His whole future life depended upon the decision of the moment. Would principle triumph? Would Joseph still be true to God? With inexpressible anxiety, angels looked upon the scene. Joseph's answer reveals the power of religious principle. He would not betray the confidence of his master on earth, and whatever the consequences, he would be true to his master in heaven. Under the inspecting eye of God and holy angels, many take liberties of which they would not be guilty in the presence of their fellow men. But Joseph's first thought was of God. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He said. If we were to cherish an habitual impression that God sees and hears all that we do and say, and keeps a faithful record of our words and actions, and that we must meet it all, we would fear to sin. Let the young ever remember that wherever they are, and whatever they do, they are in the presence of God. No part of our conduct escapes observation. We cannot hide our ways from the Most High. Human laws, though sometimes severe, are often transgressed without detection, and hence with impunity. But not so with the law of God. The deepest midnight is no cover for the guilty one. He may think himself alone, but to every deed there is an unseen witness. The very motives of his heart are open to divine inspection. Every act, every word, every thought is as distinctly marked as though there were only one person in the whole world, and the attention of heaven were centered upon him. Joseph suffered for his integrity, for his tempter revenged herself by accusing him of a foul crime and causing him to be thrust into prison. Had Potiphar believed his wife's charge against Joseph, the young Hebrew would have lost his life but the modesty and uprightness that had uniformly characterized his conduct were proof of his innocence. And yet, to save the reputation of his master's house, he was abandoned to disgrace and bondage. At the first, Joseph was treated with great severity by his jailers. The psalmist says, His feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in chains of iron. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tried him. 
Psalm 105, verses 18 and 19 in the Revised Version. But Joseph's real character shines out, even in the darkness of the dungeon. He held fast his faith and patience. His years of faithful service had been most cruelly repaid. Yet this did not render him morose or distrustful. He had the peace that comes from conscious innocence, and he trusted his case with God. He did not brood upon his own wrongs, but forgot his sorrow in trying to lighten the sorrows of others. He found a work to do even in the prison. God was preparing him in the school of affliction for greater usefulness, and he did not refuse the needful discipline. In the prison, witnessing the results of oppression and tyranny, and the effects of crime, he learned lessons of justice, sympathy, and mercy that prepared him to exercise power with wisdom and compassion. Joseph gradually gained the confidence of the keeper of the prison and was finally entrusted with the charge of all the prisoners. It was the part he acted in the prison, the integrity of his daily life and his sympathy for those who were in trouble and distress that opened the way for his future prosperity and honor. Every ray of light that we shed upon others is reflected upon ourselves. Every kind and sympathizing word spoken to the sorrowful, every act to relieve the oppressed, and every gift to the needy, if prompted by a right motive, will result in blessings to the giver. The chief baker and chief butler of the king had been cast into prison for some offense, and they came under Joseph's charge. One morning, observing that they appeared very sad, he kindly inquired the cause and was told that each had had a remarkable dream of which they were anxious to learn the significance. Do not interpretations belong to God, said Joseph. Tell me them, I pray you. As each related his dream, Joseph made known its import. In three days the butler was to be reinstated in his position and give the cup into Pharaoh's hand as before, but the chief baker would be put to death by the king's command. In both cases the event occurred as foretold. The king's cupbearer had professed the deepest gratitude to Joseph, both for the cheering interpretation of his dream and for many acts of kind attention, and in return the latter, referring in a most touching manner to his own unjust captivity, entreated that his case be brought before the king. Think on me, he said, when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house, for indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. The chief butler saw the dream fulfilled in every particular. But when restored to royal favor, he thought no more of his benefactor. For two years longer, Joseph remained a prisoner. The hope that had been kindled in his heart gradually died out, and to all other trials was added the bitter sting of ingratitude. But a divine hand was about to open the prison gates. The king of Egypt had in one night two dreams, apparently pointing to the same event and seeming to foreshadow some great calamity. He could not determine their significance, yet they continued to trouble his mind. The magicians and wise men of his realm could give no interpretation. The king's perplexity and distress increased, and terror spread throughout his palace. The general agitation recalled to the chief butler's mind the circumstances of his own dream, with it came the memory of Joseph, and a pang of remorse for his forgetfulness and ingratitude. He at once informed the king how his own dream and that of the chief baker had been interpreted by a Hebrew captive, and how the predictions had been fulfilled. It was humiliating to Pharaoh to turn away from the magicians and wise men of his kingdom to consult an alien and a slave. But he was ready to accept the lowliest service, if his troubled mind might find relief. Joseph was immediately sent for. He put off his prison attire and shaved himself, for his hair had grown long during the period of his disgrace and confinement. He was then conducted to the presence of the king. 
And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Joseph's reply to the king reveals his humility and his faith in God. He modestly disclaims the honor of possessing in himself superior wisdom. It is not in me. God alone can explain these mysteries. Pharaoh then proceeded to relate his dreams. Behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kine, fat-fleshed and well-favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kine did eat up the first seven fat kine. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them. But they were still ill-favored, as at the beginning. So I awoke, and I saw in my dream, and, behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good, and, behold, seven ears withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them, and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. The dream of Pharaoh is one, said Joseph. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. There were to be seven years of great plenty. Field and garden would yield more abundantly than ever before and this period was to be followed by seven years of famine. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. The repetition of the dream was evidence both of the certainty and nearness of the fulfillment. Now therefore, he continued, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine. The interpretation was so reasonable and consistent, and the policy which it recommended was so sound and shrewd, that its correctness could not be doubted. But who is to be entrusted with the execution of the plan? Upon the wisdom of this choice depended the nation's preservation. The king was troubled. For some time the matter of the appointment was under consideration. Through the chief butler the monarch had learned of the wisdom and prudence displayed by Joseph in the management of the prison. It was evident that he possessed administrative ability in a preeminent degree. The cupbearer, now filled with self-reproach, endeavored to atone for his former ingratitude by the warmest praise of his benefactor. And further inquiry by the king proved the correctness of his report. In all the realm, Joseph was the only man gifted with wisdom to point out the danger that threatened the kingdom and the preparation necessary to meet it. And the king was convinced that he was the one best qualified to execute the plans which he had proposed. It was evident that a divine power was with him, and that there were none among the king's officers of state so well qualified to conduct the affairs of the nation at this crisis. The fact that he was a Hebrew and a slave was of little moment when weighed against his evident wisdom and sound judgment. Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? said the king to his counselors. The appointment was decided upon, and to Joseph the astonishing announcement was made, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. 
the king proceeded to invest Joseph with the insignia of his high office. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain upon his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee. He made him lord of his house, and ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure, and teach his senators wisdom. Psalm 105, verses 21 and 22. From the dungeon, Joseph was exalted to be ruler over all the land of Egypt. It was a position of high honor, yet it was beset with difficulty and peril. One cannot stand upon a lofty height without danger. As the tempest leaves unharmed the lowly flower of the valley, while it uproots the stately tree upon the mountain top, so those who have maintained their integrity in humble life may be dragged down to the pit by the temptations that assail worldly success and honor. But Joseph's character bore the test alike of adversity and prosperity. The same fidelity to God was manifest when he stood in the palace of the pharaohs as when in a prisoner's cell. He was still a stranger in a heathen land, separated from his kindred, the worshippers of God. But he fully believed that the divine hand had directed his steps and in constant reliance upon God he faithfully discharged the duties of his position. Through Joseph the attention of the king and great men of Egypt was directed to the true God. And though they adhered to their idolatry, they learned to respect the principles revealed in the life and character of the worshiper of Jehovah. How was Joseph enabled to make such a record of firmness of character, uprightness, and wisdom? In his early years he had consulted duty rather than inclination, and the integrity, the simple trust, the noble nature of the youth bore fruit in the deeds of the man. A pure and simple life had favored the vigorous development of both physical and intellectual powers. Communion with God through his works and the contemplation of the grand truths entrusted to the inheritors of faith had elevated and ennobled his spiritual nature broadening and strengthening the mind as no other study could do. Faithful attention to duty in every station, from the lowliest to the most exalted, had been training every power for its highest service. He who lives in accordance with the Creator's will is securing to himself the truest and noblest development of character. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Job chapter 28, verse 28. There are few who realize the influence of the little things of life upon the development of character. Nothing with which we have to do is really small. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and to qualify us for greater trusts. By adherence to principle in the transactions of ordinary life, the mind becomes accustomed to hold the claims of duty above those of pleasure and inclination. Minds thus disciplined are not wavering between right and wrong, like the reed trembling in the wind. They are loyal to duty because they have trained themselves to habits of fidelity and truth. By faithfulness in that which is least, they acquire strength to be faithful in greater matters. An upright character is of greater worth than the gold of Ophir. Without it, none can rise to an honorable eminence. But character is not inherited. It cannot be bought. Moral excellence and fine mental qualities are not the result of accident. The most precious gifts are of no value unless they are improved. The formation of a noble character is the work of a lifetime and must be the result of diligent and persevering effort. God gives opportunities. Success depends upon the use made of them.